Okay, we're officially started. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I think you're going to be really glad that you came. I want to tell you right away, start thinking of questions because we're really hoping that this goes in a that this conversation goes in a direction that is helpful to you and really addresses the things that you would like to talk about. Because uh, with our guest today, Ron Jones, we could go in so many uh, different directions. And I, I want to give a short introduction of Ron Jones. I don't want to give his full list of accomplishments because that would take our entire hour and then we wouldn't get to have a conversation. But uh, Ron Jones is a musician, composer, studio owner, um, and director. He, so I grew up, unknowingly, I grew up listening to Ron Jones's music, uh, Hanna-Barbera cartoons, I was a big DuckTales fan and uh, listened to that religiously as a kid. That was Ron Jones, um, Star Trek, The Next Generation. And then uh, Family Guy, of course, was my college jam. And so had all those DVDs and watched those. So it, again, Ron Jones. Um, and, and now I will, I will tell you this, Ron, my, my kids are now watching DuckTales. Yes. So my kids are now, uh, you know, listening to your music as well. It's genetic. <laughs> it's, you know, you just can't get away. I mean, you don't want to get away from the DuckTales. But so beyond, but beyond his, I don't know, thousands and thousands of cues that he's written f to picture, um, he's written compositions. He's, he told us before, as we, before we started this call that he's working on an opera. He has a jazz band. I mean, he's just working on everything. Uh, but in addition to the incredible achievements in, in music as a composer, as an entrepreneur, he has dedicated a lot of his time to mentoring and teaching other musicians. And that's really why he's here today, because he has told me, and I know he's told Mike and, and Peregrine and others, that he just wants to help other musicians be successful and the way, you know, give his experience of how that looks. And so um, he's here donating his time completely free of charge where he told us that he has two sessions going on literally right now uh, down in uh, LA area and he's talking with you all. So um, will you help me? I, I don't know. However, we welcome people on Zoom, you know, with, you know, the silent clapping or whatever. Help me welcome Ron Jones. Thanks. Thanks so much for being here, Ron. Thanks for having me. I, I actually look forward to this. Like when you mentioned the date, I, I carved that in there because I really do feel a responsibility. It's like a, it's like a wonderful gratification because, you know, the UPS guy doesn't want to know how to make it in the music business. <laughs> and my dog doesn't want to know. And my wife has already been there. And, you know, like, like I, it, I don't get to talk about it unless somebody asks. So it's, I, I bottle this up and, you know, I can talk to the walls and, you know, uh, the people I work with, but they're all working. So we're not really talking, you know, how you do it, how you make it in the music business. Occasionally uh, my MIDI guy will come in and I'll kind of bend his ear on some aspect of something that we're talking about, like, you know, reliance upon this sort of a sample or, you know, something in the business of where it came from. And so he, he gets like a history lesson because I've been in it, you know, like before the music business was a business, you sort of like, you grow into all these things. So they just know it from now. They know it from this point and they don't realize the context. So it's, it's a joy to talk to about this stuff. Well, and I, you know, given the whole COVID situation, at least we can meet this way. I remember about four years ago, um, Peregrine Spaney organized a couple of CWU musicians to come down and visit you in your studio in Stanwood. And what I remember is that there was a wicked snowstorm that day, actually. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And we were kind of concerned if we were going to get there in one piece. Thankfully, we did. And we got back to... But, you know, for a different reason that's keeping us away from, uh, from coming to see you, I'm, I'm glad we can do this via Zoom. Um, and so, so thank you again. Can I just start with a question just sure. to kind of get the ball rolling? And then we can go in whatever direction that you want. One of the things about, you know, conversations like this is we probably won't even scratch, you know, the smallest surface of what we, what we probably need to know, but we'll do our best, I think. For sure. Um, 
so so i'm really struck by how you've chosen you know at this stage of your career especially to mentor other musicians and i wonder if we could start by going back to the beginning and if you could talk about some of your mentors and what you what you learned from them you know i'm thinking i mean you can take this in whatever direction you want but i'm especially interested in that moment where you felt like you were transitioning from student to professional and i know those probably overlap some but wherever you would maybe choose to to bring us in there could you share some of your mentors and then maybe kind of what they taught you yeah i mean when i grew up in bellevue washington over here and you know kind of a snobby middle class type of world uh, and they offered us in grade school, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade, to learn an instrument. And the first instrument I picked was a snare drum. And the teacher did not show up because it wasn't like a regular thing. So I had a snare drum, I destroyed it. So I had to buy it because we were renting it, you know, my parents didn't let go. And I thought, cool, I get to keep this weird thing. And then the next year I said, I'll try trumpet. And the, the teacher was mean. So I didn't last long. He was just one of these like taskmasters and even taking, and then I said, I'll play guitar. So I go to the, the music store and I take guitar and the guy's yelling at me and I have the wrong guitar. And my fingers are too fat or whatever it was. So my whole beginning was disastrous. But when I was about 11, my mom saw an ad or an article in the Bellevue paper about a drum and bugle corps. And she drugged me and my brother, who was a year younger than me, to the Bellevue Sentinels, signed us up. And then they point, they go, what do you want to do, drums or horns? Because that's all you had was, you didn't have a clarinet, you didn't have anything. And I, I, I go, horns? You know, like question mark, you know, because I had a trumpet. And they, they put me in there and, and the cool thing about it is drum corps have no, there was no published music at the time. So you had bugles in G and then very complex percussion. I mean, rudimental, it's like, you know what drum corps, DCI is now. I think the head of your music department came out of drum corps. Um, and so it's very sophisticated now, but it was sophisticated back then. So we had arrangers come in from the Air Force Academy, and from different places that would write charts. And I, instead of in band, like where the band director would pass out these neat parts, there'd be these handwritten with pen or pencil parts and they'd hand you the parts and then we'd work on them. You know, we'd be standing in a gymnasium and I learned intensity. I learned, you know, we'd practice for, you know, twice a week in the evening and then in the summertime, they basically, your parents would just give you up and you would just, live on a football field practicing and, and practicing in con contests and parades and, and the whole deal. That helped me a lot because in, in school, you have finite spaces like band lasts an hour, then you leave. You, the band director's just getting you going and it's bang, the bell rings and you go to the next class. That could be ornamental, you know, uh, horticulture, you know, changing tires for your car, could be English, could be lunchtime, who knows, but you never get, you just get a taste. It's the idea is to give uh, a general knowledge, but drum corps was like extreme. And I find that the, what I'm trying to model in everything I'm talking about is how to get people from the sideline to extreme. And that's where I learned that stuff. So when people were arranging, I would go, I would want to know how they did that. I wanted to learn. I would sit with the drums too. I'd say, what is a paradiddle? What is a Bradley McHugh? And, you know, I would practice with them. You know, we'd be on the bus and they're playing their sticks on the, on the seats. And I go, J -j 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 -j, you know, I'd learn it. So I just, I didn't get that stimulus in band, though I was in all the band classes I could be in, all the choir classes, anything music, like out of an eight, you know, eight slot day, six were music classes. So that's how I started. And, and so when I got to college, to, to high school, we moved from 
Bellevue to a little town in, in near Portland. The I, I knew it was kind of like weird because they had future farmers of America were the hip kids, you know, walking down the hallway with their future farmers. And I go, and they say, you will go tip a goat tonight? And I go, no, I don't think so. So they had a class called special, special uh, projects. So I went in the class and they went around the room and the teacher said, well, okay, what do you want to do, Skippy? And Skippy would say, I want to do macrame. And somebody said, I want to read a book. And somebody said, I just want to nap. And they got to me and I said, they said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go to college. And they go, what do you mean you want to go to college? I said, I want to take music theory. They said, you're a junior in high school. Okay, if you, we'll pay for the tuition if you pay for the books. So I went up to Clackamas Community College, got permission slip to leave, failed miserably, didn't tell the principal or anyone, just went back in the practice room with the lights off, took my music theory book and did it all so that when I got my senior year, I took it again and I aced it. So I was ahead of a, a year ahead in all of my classes in music theory, because imagine being a high school senior and you're taking that. And I was taking 20, uh, uh, 16th century counterpoint from a Catholic nun who had a PhD from Halsey Stevens, Bella Bartok, and Nadia Boulanger. So imagine taking those kind of classes as a high school kid. And then we started, my, I, my brother and I, we were in this little town, so my, we couldn't be near the drum corps we wanted. So I said to my dad and mom, can we start a drum corps? And they said, you mean with buses and trucks and equipment? I said, yeah. And they said, sure. <laughs> so we started, we started the Oregon Crusaders, which has been going 50 years now. And it's like a multi-million dollar educational corporation and kids from all over the place. But we started that as high school kids. And we had buses and trucks and everything. So you're probably sitting there going, well, what is Ron, Ron, everything Ron said has nothing to do with me because I didn't start a drum corps. I went to, didn't go to college in high school and I wasn't a nut. But that's my story of how I got going. So when I was 21, I had my music on ABC, NBC, CBS. So I rest my case. <laughs> well, you know, something that I've heard you talk about before is the, you know, the importance of talent, but the importance of, hard, importance of hard work. And not just hard work, it seems, from that story you just told, but also, you know, being proactive and creating things, building things. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what, you know, what that element is, because sometimes it feels like as musicians, if I just go in my room and I just practice, then when I emerge, uh, opportunities will simply materialize. But that doesn't seem to be how it actually, actually happens. When, when music teachers get together in the coffee shop or, or at a music conference, the main topic, other than what do you do on your off time, and they do off-roading or whatever they do, is how do I motivate the students? Because they might have a lethargic choir or they might have the band doesn't want to practice. So you can only yell so much and everything's sort of politically correct so the teacher can't get too womp, can't womp them, you know, can't threaten corporal punishment for not practicing the cello. So what do you do? So it comes down to motivation. That's why in the, the paper that I printed up, I said, there's, there's, there's kind of like the main line of in college, you're going to have music theory one, theory two, music history, music business, uh, your instrument, whatever, all those kinds of collection of things is very valuable track. But if you don't have motivation, you'll go in there, say you play trombone, Sally might practice three more hours a week than Timmy, you know, like why, what's, how do you get Timmy going? You know, how do you threaten Timmy? How do you, you know, like when all else fails. So 
the people that you'll run into in the studios don't have this problem. There is no question of motivation. At the end of the month, they got to pay their rent. At the end of the month, they got to buy, they got to buy groceries, you know? So there's no problem with motivation because if you don't do it, you die. So I love death. Death is a great motivator. You know, like if somebody said you have cancer, you would be motivated to fight it, right? Because the, op the option is death. But so you don't practice your cello for a week. Are you going to die? So you go, Neh, you know, okay, I, I didn't practice this week. So there, there, it, it, it shouldn't be corny. It shouldn't be like the teacher says, well, if you don't do this, you're not going to succeed. But really, if you don't do this, you're not going to succeed. It's like, it's pretty cut and dried, like, like gravity. If you mess with gravity, Matt, gravity will smash you. You know, try jumping off the Grand Canyon. You know, see what happens. It's going to be a fatal mistake because you're going to die. So you can't sustain a, that energy. So my, my thing is I've always been motivated. I love creating. I love making this stuff. Nobody forced me to do all those feature films. Nobody forced me to do Family Guy. Towards the end, I got tired. I mean, I, I turned in my resignation after 15 years, you know, because I didn't want to become Alf Clausen. You know, I kept telling people, I'd stand at the, on the podium at Fox and say, I don't want to be Alf Clausen. Oh, okay, here we go. One, two, you know, I count off the click. I, I would just announce it, you know. <laughs> And I knew Alf Clausen, you know, he did The Simpsons for 25 years. You know, it's like, I didn't want to be a vegetable, you know, at the end of that. Because if, if you had asked Beethoven to do Family Guy, he probably would have gone nuts after a year. You know, uh, there's like only so much you can handle of, of doing certain things, working with certain people. So I think I've been motivated. That's like in that list of books, if they ever look at my list of books. There's one called Exceptional. There's another one called Outliers. And that deals with that, that whole component of how to be exceptional. And if you're not in the business of being exceptional, how are you going to be a teacher that's exceptional? Do you want to just be off the shelf, you know, generic Costco brand teacher? Are you going to be someone just doing your time? Just, just doing what the, the union says? Are you going to excel? Do you want to be the principal of the, do you want to be the head of the, of the music department? Do you want to have some ambition? I mean, these are, these are questions, you know, and this generation, you guys are getting hit with depression right now with COVID. You got hit with the 2008, 2009 debacle you got hit with the 2003 2004 debacle your whole life has been financial peril and maybe your parents lost it during one of those times and gained it back lost their savings lost their home whatever but i mean you've been through a lot so i could i want to answer these questions i want you to take revenge on the world can i so I want to ask maybe one more question and then I, I would really love the, for the students to ask something. Okay. Um, the, so, okay. First, I guess an observation and then maybe a question for you. I'm going to try and come at this question so that it makes sense. One of the things that I just heard from you is that your career can't be like pro forma, right? Like somebody else says you should do this, this, and this that's not going to lead to success. You have to generate and be proactive. It, you need to be a fountain of energy in some way. But one of the things that I see in myself and that I have seen in myself and that I see sometimes in students is that there's a very limited perspective on what the potential career paths are for musicians. And what I've heard you say in just the couple minutes that we've been talking is of lots of different niches that people are excelling at in the music industry. So here's my kind of weird question. Could you walk us through in a given week, like what are the different niche career paths that you come in contact with? So let me get you, give me an example. You were telling us before we started the call, um, 
before we started recording about a singer in uh, in California who set up her own personal studio and is doing lots of recording on sessions remotely. You talked about you have a MIDI guy, right? Like there's a MIDI guy. You, you've talked about arrangers. Uh, you've talked about composers. You talk about, so I wonder if you could talk through some, just kind of widen our perspective of the possibilities. And here's the reason I ask that. I imagine there are maybe some students here thinking, well, I mean, I know I want to be a musician, but I don't have that kind of mus motivation to be a composer or to be like the principal in a symphony orchestra or to be a teacher. Yeah. But I know I have something. I just don't know. I don't have a range of options. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can you and walk I, us I, through I, some of those? I, well, first of all, when, when I was in Hollywood, the, the maximum amount that was spent in music, in production for all of Hollywood uh, films was eight billion in a year. And that was from the major studios, primarily Sony, uh, Disney, Fox, you know, uh, MGM, whatever. Eight billion, and that was the pie. Everybody thought, wow, what a fat pie. And people in Beverly Hills have big Rolls Royces and everybody's cooking, we're all cooking. All right, then uh, uh, Netflix screws up and they go into chapter 11 and their CEO says, we're going to change things. So he changes things. So somehow he gets a fund of like $12 billion just for Netflix. Now the whole budget for LA for all production was 8 billion in a year. He brought in 12. So now you got 20 billion. So it's double and then some. Then Amazon Red said, hey, we're going to kick in nine. Warner Brothers had a, 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 a network. Paramount has a network. CBS has a network. Um, Amazon, well, I already mentioned Amazon. Um, Google has a network. Apple has a TV thing, you know, whatever. So each one kicked in. So we're talking about more like $45 billion. That's more than Boeing. Okay, so you're thinking, your parents are thinking, you know, if I just get Skippy a job after college at Boeing, he can be on the assembly line. Well, Boeing's moving a chunk of it to South Carolina. So sorry about that. If you want to be a riveter, it's going there. So but the, the industry is cooking. So there's 400% there's more work than ever. <clears throat> so, you know, you say, well, what's the, what, where do I fit in there? Oh, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of places. You get to actually define. There's no cookie cutter. There is no generic second violin role. Everybody, you know, like, uh, here, here's a, a little story. Um, when I was starting out and I was at Dick Grove School, when I first got to LA, taking arranging and composing, I needed to work. My wife was working at Pizza Hut and we're paying for her tuition and everything. I never took any student loans. And um, so I'm paying for all that. And I just got out of college out of Seattle Pacific. And uh, I was working at a copy office. And I kept seeing this one guy bringing in all these charts. We were copying for sessions. I copy him, copy, and I said, hey, Terry, what's the deal with you? How come you, you know, I wanted to know as a kid, like a kid, you know, where's the work? I don't want to copy, you know, what's, what's going on? He says, I said, can I come over and meet with you some Saturday or something? He says, okay, great. So here's my number. So everyone's nice, you know. So I call him and I go over to his place. He's got a little house. He's got a baby in a crib his wife, his trumpet, a little area to write. I said, well, what's the deal with you? How, how do you do this? It seems like you always have sessions and gigs. You're either playing or you're writing. He says, yeah, okay. He says, if I had one gig, a really good one, and I lost it, that's 100%. If I have 100 gigs and I lose one of them, I got 99%. That's a great lesson right there. That was like, thank you, Terry, I'm leaving. You're like five minutes into the discussion. 
I picked up on what that was. And so I tried to, all the time I was freelancing, to have tons of gigs. So like even when I had Star Trek Next Generation, I had Disney's DuckTales, I had Mission Impossible at Paramount, and I had Superman at Ruby and Spears. I had four series at four different studios. You know, like, so, so you know, you can, it, so there, there, that, the problem is dualistic thinking. And I was, I was trying to put this into words because I knew they were going to ask that question. It's like, if you're dualistic, you say, yeah, I like vegetables and I see some vegetables there, but I really like hamburger. You know, you can't decide what you're going to do. Are you vegan? Or are you, are you going to eat meat? What is it? You do? You can, you're confused. So, you know, it's dualistic thinking, like uh, the girls are thinking, well, I'm going to get married in five years. I want that. And I want a music career. And I want all this stuff. So they, the dualistic thing will start to unravel why they're in school. Because they'll go, well, if I'm going to be Susie Homemaker, why do I need cello? And they start getting dualistic about it. But you know what? There's a lot of housewives that are very successful session players. They're all over the place. I mean, there's half of the, the, the symphony in Salt Lake is housewives. For the opera, for the symphony, for the whole deal. Like it's housewives. And they, they're coming in there and they play and then they go home and they change a diaper. So they found a way to be in the music business. They found a way to couple things. So don't be dualistic. Just try to look at the landscape of what you have to do. So... The world is really very bright. It's actually super bright, you know, and, and actually the people that I know that are working are people that don't think about work. They just love it. They're just like, they're like what they wake out of, they get out of bed on fire, like let's go. And they'll go play tennis, jump in the pool, get out, barbecue something and go do a gig. Like they're just, you know, they, they have more fun. Like I call them, I say, how come you guys are the only guys having fun during the pandemic? Like I would, I would call my woodwind, one of my woodwind guys, Fred Selden. He lives just off of Sunset Boulevard up on the Hollywood Hills. And he has a beautiful house and a big swimming pool outside. And I'm call, talking to him. He says, hey, Ron, I gotta go. You know, I, the, the cleaning lady, like she made like this special French sauce that's going to go on the salmon <laughs> so i'm going to take a dip and then i'm going to have my salmon i said oh suffering are we we are suffering during the pandemic you're like i have not heard a sad story <laughs> from any of those guys because they're all doing stuff they're busy i i just got a jazz album from a friend of mine that recorded everything virtually like the whole the whole group was everywhere in the world he was in la the organ guy was in New York or somewhere and the bass player was in Albuquerque. I mean, it was everywhere and it sounded great. It sounded like they were in the room. So we're seeing new technology change. So did, does that sort of get at the answer? It doesn't give a specific pathway to it, but I'm just saying you said about what's the range of possibilities. And you know what, guess what? It's what you meant. It's, it's like I can walk out the door and be down and go, oh, the world is screwed up. The world is screwed up. Or I can go, the world's screwed up. I'm going to learn Portuguese. So when it's over, I can go to Portugal and do what? Do things, you know? So I'm writing an opera now because I want to have an opera when I'm done, when the world comes back, you know? So why not spend two years working on the opera now? You know, why not do the hard thing now? Why not be in college? You know, because what the job market is kind of sucky out there. They're losing 5 million jobs a week. But these are, these are stupid jobs. This is like working at Hormel, making turkey sausage. You know, like, do you really want that job? I don't want that job. <laughs> I want to be in the music business. I want to be, you know... And the thing is, my money comes in funny. My wife doesn't even tell me when it comes in because it's royalties from France and everywhere. So she goes, guess what, honey? I go, what? And she goes, oh, you got to check. And I'll say, how much? She goes, I'm not telling you. 
because she'll know I'm going to buy stuff. So it might, it's usually six figures. You know, it's like, you know, each quarter is like a nice chunk of bread and I'll go, Hey, you know, we do need that tractor. You know, we do need that thing. And she, and she go, yeah, well, we can do that if you really must, but she won't tell me because if I see the zeros behind the comma, then I will go nuts. So she doesn't, you know, she tries to keep it a lid on it, but that's, isn't that weird? Like I make money because my music playing on all the airways. As you go to direct TV, I can find a hundred shows of mine playing at any given time. There's 800 channels, right? Or a thousand channels. So out of, that I have that many things like Family Guy is playing all the time, Star Trek next year. All these shows are playing, and I get paid like brand new, like today, you know, like like I just did it, like I scored it, like I slaved. That no, no. How do you do that? <laughs> how can I tell people how to do that? <laughs> yeah, well. I mean, building assets is a whole topic. Maybe that it, we can get into that if we want. Yeah. But what I what I take away from this, and I would encourage uh, those listening to think about, is that it's almost well. Consider this: it's almost more important to do something that you're so intensely fired up about than it is to do something what's expected of you that you think is you know that you have to do. Um, yeah, so repos you, re reposition yourself reposition who you see yourself at, reposition the school. Like the school should be like your training lab. This should be like, like you're in the NBA and you've got the finest coaches around you. You know, you're paying for the finest coaching. You've got, you've got everybody around you, all this wonderful, the orchestra guy, you've got the, the vocal people, you've got your music business people, you've got this... I mean, even when you go to, to the commissary, it's a wonderful sandwich, you know? Like you should just go, great, I just am so motivated by this. Reposition yourself to not think, oh, it's the world, what the world gives to me. Like John F. Kennedy said in the speech about going to the moon, he was at Rice University on a football field on a hot day. He says, we go to the moon and do the other thing, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And, and he gave uh, another speech where he said, you know, do, I basically, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, is that it's not what you can do, it's not, it's not what the country can do for you, it's what you can do for your country. And he founded the Peace Corps. So people would go out and do the Peace Corps and Americans would go to Brazil and go to places, help them have water and crops. And they got to know the people. It was the greatest way to reach out to the world ever. And those people came back with an awareness that they wouldn't have had of human, humankind just growing up in America. They could bring their skills. That's what college kids did. Right now, I think there's a lot of emphasis on self. And the more you focus on self, you know, like you need a good self. I mean, there's a crazy self and there's a good self. You need the good self it's not maniacal about things, but that you're compulsive about doing something great. That's all I want to do. I know, I know that seems weird. You go, Ron Jones is weird. That's right. I am weird. That's how you do it. Everybody I know is weird. Everybody I know, Brad Dutz, who's recording the percussion, is weird. We could get on the phone with him right now. And I'd say, do you have a chinta there? And he goes, yeah, a chinta. And he grabs a chinta. Like in his living room, he has, uh, you know, a Peruvian shaker, you know. Like, who has a Peruvian shaker right by the phone? He does. You know, like there's, and you call that singer. I'd be calling the singer. And she said, oh, I can't talk now. I'm doing a, a, I'm singing a vocal for a movie theme. You know, I'm doing a Spielberg thing. You know, like they are, humans like you and me like each one of us but they get they get excited about things maybe different so reposition how you get excited about things you know like if you smile in the mirror it sends endorphins back to your brain and pretty soon you're happy because squirting the 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 muscles here triggers endorphins Endorphins make you feel good. So if you're scared, you're going like, Durr. 
like everyone's watching this video, they're all like, yes, because they're going, how am I going to make it in the reservoir? You know, he's saying impossible things. Uh, but if you smile and you squeeze the dimples, you're going to send endorphins. So you have the, the books I listed, Outliers, Coaching the Artist Within, ha talks about those dynamics. They're not about the music business, but they're about the business of getting yourself into a position where you can do that. Because if you don't do this, say next year you say, I'm going to major in biology, you're going to have the same problem. It'll be a nightmare unless you love biology. It's going to be a nightmare unless you love business, unless you love PTA meetings. You're not going to love being a teacher. You know, like, and you don't want to wear a suit. You don't want to wear, you know, you don't want to dress up. So there's going to be negativity in everything you do. So you might as well figure out music because it's one of the greatest ones ever. It's the best one there is. Okay, can we can we pause there and see if there are any questions? I would, I'd love to hear love where it. you all want to take this conversation. What do you want to know about? What do you want to ask Ron um, about? You can put questions. Uh, so Peregrine has a question. We'll go to Peregrine first. You can just start listing your questions in the chat so that we know how many questions there are so we can get to as many of them as we can. Peregrine, take it away. Awesome. Thanks, uh, Mark. Thanks, Ron. Yep. Um, so I'm going to try and get this as quickly and frame it as concisely as possible. So when I graduated, like I tried to get as many gigs as possible at any one time I had between three and five jobs. They're all music or event related. COVID hits, I lose all of them, but I'm not just going to like sit around on my ass. Mm -hmm. So I like, I hit up a warehouse and I've been there ever since. And I love it because it gives me time to think about ideas and music and listen to things all day. Yeah. So I guess my question for you, and without getting too much into why do people go to music school? Whose responsibility is it for anyone's career? Do you think the pandemic has provided a call to action to music faculty in regard to career readiness versus artistic readiness outside of being trained to become a music educator? I think, I think the faculty I've talked to, and I'm, I'm talking about um, a wide variety of faculty, is so interested in your success. And every, every young student that comes in, it's like, it's like you're part of their family and they want you to succeed like you're their son or daughter. And it kills them if they can't put you out there and have you fly, you know? They wanna throw you out of the nest when you get your degree, but they want you to land, you know? So I think they do. I think the, pro the problem that I keep saying and what I keep harping on is there's, you know, like I tell people, there's friendship 101. Like, for, haven't you noticed that you got out and you're in the warehouse, but you got to make friends with, with uh, Charlie and Seymour and Gladys. And, yet, and they're not your type of people, but you got to make friends with them. You know, hey, how's it going, Charlie? Hey, how's it going with the, the Lakers? You know, like, you know, you're not a Laker fan, but you're going to talk. You know, like, because if you don't, you just come in and you do your thing, you're going to be perceived as a real dick, Right. And you're not going to get through it. The same thing is true in the music business. Again, I'm not going to use an expletive, but, you know, level one of the music business is you learn to eat blank. Level two, you know you move to level two when you like the taste of blank. And level three is when you can pass it out to other people. So you know on the, on the scale of the music business where you are, are you passing it out? Are you eating it? You know, are you, are you liking it? You know, so, so in your 20s, you don't like it, but you're having to, you know, eat it. So there's, there's a whole thing you have to go through. So that I keep, I keep trying to get people to prepare for that dip that's going to happen out there. And the, 
what I've noticed just since I'm answering, I'm not answering it on behalf of any faculty member, but what I've noticed as an outside person is they got so many hours to teach you or anyone. And either the, the students, some students work really hard and some people do medium hard and some got the least amount feasible to get through. And they can't motivate them harshly beyond a certain point. Like if you're on a football team, the defensive uh, coordinator can yell at you and beat you with something to get you to be a better player. But the, you know, you're not in football. You're not in a, you're not on the Husky team. You're not on that. So they're not going to do that in poetry class. Hey, you're not, you know, they'd hit you with a book every time you don't read the assignment. So part of it is the student. And I'd say the student needs to assume 100% of the blame because you're not looking beyond what is going to happen beyond. That's why I got on this Zoom call is I wanted to answer that question. And it pisses off some people and it doesn't piss off other people. But I wanted to answer that because I was like you guys. I got out and then you go, now what? Only I was it dumped in LA, you know? I went from Seattle, we packed up our car and went to LA to North Hollywood and I didn't know a soul. Didn't know a soul. But within a month I was working in a copy office, right, you know, doing things that were they copied for Sinatra and Hanna-Barbera and all that stuff. And I was making like nine bucks an hour you know, like some ridiculous, but I didn't care because I, I was in, I had my foot in the door. But anyways, enough about me. I mean, I figured out how to do it. You guys are trying to figure it out. So as I've tried to answer this in a nebulous way, is there another question that would help refine that question, Peregrine? I mean, what, I mean, you're saying, okay, how do I, I don't want to indict the faculty that, that give is giving their life to teach you. And I don't want to indict the people that are out there that are suffering that have hard, having a hard time. We're all in the same silly boat, you know, and screw the pandemic. We're going to be in this for another year, at least before they come out with some sorts of beginnings of vaccination. And we may be wearing masks for five years and we may not be able to get the music business live the live business back to what it was but i'm telling you people are cooking out there there's a lot of people that are making more bread now than they did before it so the key is how do you get in on that action how do you get in on that so like i was saying you know earlier to mark uh and, and to mike is that a lot of the session guys now since they're we're not in having a session I call people and they record at home and they record their part to tracks. Like just this morning, well, just last night at, at before dinner, I, I decided I needed live percussion on some tracks for a song. And so I said, uh, I called my percussion guy in LA. I said, hey, Brad, can you, can you lay some tracks? I need you to do all the percussion and timpani. Is that possible? He goes, yeah. When do you need it? I said, well, you know, I'm loose, but, you know, the next three, four days. Oh, great. Okay, good. Got it. Send me the tracks. I need a stereo mix, and I need a click track. Done. Okay, so I pick up the phone. I call my engineer in Federal Way, and I say, hey, Bill, I need you to make a mix without the percussion, the, the rough percussion, and without, you know, that's Bill calling right now. Um without those things in it and send it to Brad. So this morning he calls me at 9.15 and says, hey, I sent the tracks off. And I sent him, Brad, the PDF of the parts the, last night. So he's waking up this morning, checking his email, downloading the tracks. He's probably in his living room recording right now. I'll send him the check either by mail or by, by PayPal. <sighs> Done. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and uh, unusual about that. <laughs> and 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 I completely agree with uh, a majority, if not all, the responsibilities on 
the person making the decision, like, is this something I want to do? Am I going to put effort in? And if you're not, then it's not going to pan out. Um, and yeah, and, that, and that take, take responsibility yeah. for yourself. You know, like exactly. the, te the teachers can say, hey, yeah, I blew it one year. And then they fix it. The students need to say, I blew it my freshman year, part of the sophomore, and then I woke up. You know, something else. We're not, nobody's perfect. Yeah. This, is, this is all not a, there's no rehearsal. This is the performance we're in. And so, you know, I was a terrible, I practiced, I, I was never in the practice room, you know, except for to play gongs. I played gongs a lot in the dark. And I would, I, I wrote music. So I was in there writing, you know, I didn't, people would say, why do you practice your French horn, Ron? I said, I don't care. I don't want to be a French horn player. I'll play in the choir, I'll play in the band and I'll play in the orchestra to get three credits. And it's, I get to sit and listen to Sibelius and play the fourth horn part. But I'm not going to go out there and make a gig out of this. I know I was going to write. So, you know, I didn't practice on that stuff. But boy, if you wanted to be a French horn player and you wanted to get a gig in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, you better practice your butt off, you know. So choose your poison well because you're going to have to take it. There's no other poisons. There, it, it's the same poison. If you wanted to work at, at Microsoft, you would get a, an entry job and then you have to work your way up for 25 years to mid, middle management if you don't get fired, transferred, or sick. And then, then you go, now how do I get past the ceiling? How do I get to the next level? Well, you only had a, uh, a, a bachelor's degree in, in uh, chemical engineering and you needed a PhD. So maybe you might take a PhD on the side for a couple of years and then you can move forward, you know, but you're going to have to fight no matter what molehill you pick, you're going to, you're going to climb a hill. So, so the, the idea that the fallacy is that people think, oh, the music business is an ad hill. I can't climb. Oh yeah. So you're going to go do Microsoft. <laughs> you're going to go do these other goofy ones. You're going to do Joe's hardware store. You know, what are you going to do? Like at the end of the day, you're 50 years old. What do you want to be? You know, I know people that are 50, I'm 66 and they love it. They love being in the music business. They wouldn't be in any other business. And they had a ball with it. They make a lot of money. And maybe their wife's a nurse and they have to actually go do 12 hour shifts being a nurse, delivering babies or some crazy thing, you know. I, which one do you want? Which one do you want to do? Work in a hospital or work at home and write music for television or something? I mean, I wouldn't, I don't think it's a contest, <laughs> but there's certainly more people in the nursing department than there are in the music department, probably, because people think that's an easier road. But I don't, I don't think it's an easier road. Well, um, I wonder if we could, we actually have several questions that are Great, let's uh, go waiting it. to be answered. Let's, uh, let's move forward. But before we move on from that question, I wonder if, um, you know, we should have a discussion with Peregrine at, and the club at some other time. We don't have nearly enough conversations about this right? Uh -huh. Like, what is it really like? So uh, maybe we can talk about that um, in the future. I see. So yeah, we have questions. you can always email me. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I see questions from Alberto, from Maxwell, Nathan, Daniel, and then Allison. Let's start with Alberto. Okay. Um, hi. Well, first, I just want to know, um, like, am I only allowed to ask one question or like? Well, well, let's get it started and we'll see how it goes. Okay. Well, the first question I was wondering is, um, how do you approach working with like, when you're working like on a project, how do you work, approach working with um, like a creator on like how you want the music to be done? Like if, you know, like, because um, obviously working with people who are musically inclined versus maybe not musically inclined, they, you know, they still want a certain like vibe or um, feeling in the music and to fit the show or the film. And I was wondering how do you, or what advice would you recommend ex actually um, from well, I, uh, Okay, that's a, that's a very good question. Okay, Alberto, that's a very good question. 
Um, and it's one of the key things that's part of film scoring is spotting the film and talking about the creative side. The people that do it really well actually get way better work, whether they're a better musician or not, to, to be able to talk to these people. So I think it starts with listening. And usually they give you, before you meet with them, you get a script. So you can read the script or your agent will send you the, the script and say, hey, so-and-so wants to talk to you about music. He wants to talk to you about a project. And the other thing realizes that these guys were writers and filmmakers. So they spooled off into a whole different bunch of buildings. They don't give a crap about music. They don't know anything about music other than music happens at some point and they need some. And so they're thinking camera angles. They're thinking dialogue. Oh, I love that line. You know, I can't wait till the guy comes in and says, give me the scrub brush, Jimmy. Like they, that's what they live for. They, they have fantasies about dreaming of lines and stuff. They don't have any fantasies about music. So you come to them as somebody from Mars that breathes different oxygen, different air. You, you breathe methane. And when you talk, it's backwards. Like, <laughs> you know, like they don't understand. Like if you start talking, I want to put arpeggios, but I'm going to have counterpoint and I'm going to modulate when we get to the fifth act and I'm going to only use wood blocks. You know, like, you know, they don't understand what you're talking. They're going, oh, that sounds sexy, man, but can we afford it? You know, like they, they don't, they're thinking the most bizarre thing. So you have to practice by listening to people. Like for instance, um, a waiter comes in and he works in a restaurant, nice restaurant. He comes in and he sees the young couple. He might suggest something. He says, so let's try the tortellini. What do you think about tortellini? Would you like tortellini and salad and thing? And they go, yeah, that sounds great. But then he goes over the old couple and the old couple, you know, like you start to get a feel for for individuals. And so just know that most music people don't want you to talk about the dialect that you learn in music school. If it's dialect that has to do with counterpoint and stuff, and what you say is thick, thin, dramatic, with the picture, against the picture, they understand that. Or if you know that they're a fan of certain things, you can say, okay, in, uh, you know, Sand Pebbles, they used a lot of, uh, of, of, of keyboard percussion. And they go, what does that mean? You know, like I said, it's kind of a tinkle, tinkle, tinkle sound. You know, like you have to translate it without sounding stupid into a, into a language that they can understand because we're coming from Mars and they're coming from a different planet. So the problem is how do you how do you get them to talk? So it's about communication. I tell I tell film composers like when I'm teaching the film composer, I say, you know what? Here's an exercise. Every day meet five people you've never talked to, five people you'd never talk to. And they go, That's scary. How am I gonna do that? I said, Well, you're you're walking between your office and the thing. You're gonna talk and you say, Hey, what time is it? Can you tell me the time, sir? They go, well, it's four o'clock, you know, and he walks off. Oh, thank you, sir. It's, it's great, you know, and, and, you know, at least you make contact with a person. Or in the grocery store, you're standing, standing in the fruit aisle, and you say, hey, are these grapefruits any good? And the lady goes, yeah, they're great. And guess what? I like these ones here from South America. You know, like you develop a conversation. And you say, have you been coming to this store a long time? Yo, yeah, gosh, I came here when this place opened. My kids used to come here. In fact, my brother-in-law works in the back room. You're like, now you know a lot about them. So you want to use the same people skills to talk to producers. But a lot of it is you want to listen. You want to ask them questions. Like, do you see this as a drama? Is this, do you see that character being played harsh or do you want do you want something against what he's about you know like you need to get into characters story so if you know the show inside out and you've read the script watched them the video a couple times when you come into the spotting you're like with them but if you don't if you've never seen it you come in they show you the picture you're going oh my god you know this is terrible like you 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 can't fake it you can't communicate so before i go into spotting 
I've seen the show frontwards and backwards. I know every frame so that I can duel with them because it's a duel. Every producer is very smart. They're like PhD guys. They're smart. Don't take them for granted, even if they act like they're, like they're leather jackets, you know, chewing gum. Uh-uh. That's just, they went to Princeton. They've got a, a multi-picture multi deal. They, they're worth millions of dollars, and they're not screwing around. None of them got there without paying their dues. So you got to respect that. You know, you may think they're Elmer Fudd, but they're not Elmer Fudd. So you, you have to have a whole mindset. You know, like you practice things, like you practice an event in the, in the Olympics. And for film composers, spotting the film is an Olympic event. So you need to work on it. So it's a thing, yeah. Great. Alberto, we'll maybe come back to questions uh, later if there's time, if okay. that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so Max, you have a, you have a question? Yeah, uh, hi, I'm Max. Uh, this will probably be kind of a uh, quicker question, but uh, you do mention about like uh, sort of splitting ro I'm sorry, streams, splitting what? You know, it, it, uh, 100 gigs, one gig or whatever. Your, and, uh, your video oh, yeah, cut I'm, out for a second. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, as far as splitting revenue streams, I'm aware you both have like a recording studio as well as, of course, your film work. Mm -hmm. um, as somebody who has been doing uh, some freelance film work as well as uh, just uh, like music production in a DAW for the last five years, uh, did you sort of build both of those sides of what you do simultaneously or were you a writer first that uh, started acquiring toys? When I was in LA, I had no gear whatsoever other than my computer, you know, my desktop computer. And I had a video monitor, a light, several lights, uh, a writing desk, hard drives, and I could do email, I could answer the phone. I didn't have any gear whatsoever. I mean, every once in a while I would go and say, oh, I'm gonna buy a mixer, I'm gonna buy stuff. And then I, two years later, I'd give it away. I just call up one of my worthy assistants and say, hey, you want this mixer thing? You know, it cost me 20 grand. And I give it to him because I don't, I don't want it. So when I moved 1,252 miles north of L.A., see, I, in L.A. I was spoiled. I had 20th Century Fox with a $6 million console, 96-piece orchestra, uh, six assistants, copyists, 30 copyists, uh, the finest players in the world. Then I move up here to Bangladesh. And I said to my wife, I said, you know, I need to find a place. So I, I lo we looked for property so I could, I, so this building I'm in, I have 3,000 square feet for my studio. Plus we built a 1,700 foot guest house slash on the bottom is a workshop and uh, storage for the scores and, you know, file cabinets, all that stuff. So I had to build from scratch. So I had, I had one microphone that was crummy when I came up just because I somehow acquired, I didn't throw it away. And so now I have over 80. You know, I have everything from U87s, all the Sennheisers, the Royer ribbons, everything. I have the best mic pre's. I have an SSL console. I have... Um, you know, all this, the toys, I have a, a mixing room that's just like a control room. I have a MIDI room that's world-class. I have a scoring stage. I have parking for 150 cars, you know, 22 acres. So, I mean, it's overkill. So I built this in the last five and a half years from nothing into uh, a usable studio because I didn't want to have to get on a plane to fly down to LA. But basically I'm not a Seattle studio. I'm an LA studio, 1,252 miles north of LA because everything I do is with LA pretty much. Occasionally I'll do things with Seattle guys and my MIDI guy is from Seattle. He drives up from Seattle. But he was originally from Chicago 
and he had a graduate degree from Berkeley in Boston. He just happens to be here because his wife went to the University of Washington and studied um, atmospheric sciences. And so he was here and I found him and I said, hey, you know, you know, train him to do what I want him to do. But he teaches lessons, private lessons, and he's a composer, working composer himself. So he's just here one, twice a week, you know. Cool. So I did, I, so, so streams, I don't, this is all overhead, you know. This, this is all overhead because during the pandemic, we're not recording. I have had to turn down record projects one after another because you can't get the engineer in the control room and then the client, what are you going to all wear masks and, you know, have social dis distancing, you know, you can't, you can't have a string section six feet apart. That's not how you get that sound or a choir, you know, like they got to be elbow, you know, elbow to elbow. So you can't acoustically pull that off. You can do individuals. So I find it's easier at this point to work remotely and, and the tracks come to me and then I send them to my engineer who's not even here. And he's moving from Federal Way to Phoenix. He bought, just bought a house in Phoenix. So, and he says, oh, I hope you don't mind that I move. I said, what difference does it make? You might as well be in Phoenix where it's warm because I'm not going to see you anyhow. <laughs> That's the truth. So, so it's, it doesn't matter where they are. It matters what you can get, what you can get from, you know, that's what matters. So, so Ron, I wonder, do you have time for a couple more questions or do we need I to have, wrap it up? No, I have all the time you want to go. I'll go as long as you guys want to go. Okay. I know um, if, if some others have to go to do other things, that's totally fine. But um, thanks for being willing to uh, ask, answer a couple more questions. The next one's from Nathan, and then we'll go to Daniel. Okay. Um, hello, um, good to meet you. Um, I had a quick question. Uh, this may be a quick question, but I am sort of at a crossroads as far as my future, and I'm considering uh, either going to grad school or just going out into the field and, and playing, uh, freelancing. And in your opinion, which would be the best choice for me to make? Um. You know, you're going to, you're going to learn from both choices because you could, you could do, you could go to one, one fork in the road and maybe it wouldn't be as great as you thought. And you may go on there, you won't know. So just pick a direction, you know, flip a coin and go, go with it because, because it's going to, it's everywhere you go, there you are in it, you know, there you are. So if you find yourself in the midst of a bunch of great things going on, great. If you're not, you're going to have to change that to get to the, so either way, you're going to have to use your skills. Think of your course of development as not being linear. In school, everyone thinks it's a, it's a rocket that's aimed a direction. I start in kindergarten and the rocket goes through junior high, high school. I'm going to refuel, go to college, and then I come out the other side like it's one long spaghettio. But it is all over the it's backwards. What if your mom got cancer? What if what if uh you know the the money runs out? What if you you get sick or what if you're not liking the school or you want to change your major from music theory to composition or you want to be a cello player not a trombone player you know like there's you know you're gonna wiggle through things so it begins to look like spaghettios you know so you need a map so if if you have a map and on the map is just north and somebody says i want you to be able to go to hawaii well, what do you do? You know, you go, okay, I got north. So if I go this way, out in this big white expanse, maybe I'll get, but you don't know there's an ocean because that would be on the map, right? And the map doesn't have that. So you're going to die out in the water. What happens if people, because they don't have a map, which means a map is just detailed information, gives you the interstates, where the gas stations are, the overpasses, the hotels, the cities. 
So you go, oh, I got enough gas to make it to Spokane. Oh, I'm going to have to go over a, a higher, the mountains. I, my car can't make it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so you're going to look at the trajectories of where you're going to go. So you need to do some gathering of information. The more information you gather, the more detailed Nathan's map is going to be. If you have several integers, now you have more data. Imagine a satellite that went around and it's trying to collect data, but it only gets one number. It's not going to tell you anything. You need plus, minus, you know, X factor, Y factor, Z factor to be able to triangulate where you are. Like, how does GPS work? It's not one satellite. It's a bunch of satellites. And it tells you, oh, you're here. You're at Dairy Queen in Ferndale, you know, and you're going to go five miles to the Pizza Hut. Whatever it is, the map will get you there because you have integers. So school, the whole purpose of school is to give you the integers so that you can aim your boat the way you want to go and avoid going into death mode. So my answer is either one could be great and you could probably make either one work. There's no good or bad. The question is which one's going to be better for you as far as your trajectory. Where does your rocket want to go? Great. Thank you. Answer that and you'll got it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Nathan. Daniel. Hi. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Um, I, I was just curious, as someone who wants to work as a film score composer, how do you deal with um, the creative stiflement that comes about from like things like uh, when the producer or director wants to use a temp score and they're very rigid on that idea, as opposed to the more ideal situation of giving you creative space to just do as you please? Like, how do you sort of like handle that situation? And like work within that kind of model that's very prominent these days? Well, I, I had uh, lunch with uh, Tyler Bates before I left LA and we had, we were in a nice restaurant and he had just scored uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm. And it was a hit of the summer. And I said, look, how much did you get to write? Because I know how crazy it is, Marvel and you know, their, their rules. He had the composer like a set of rules. When it's a, uh, the characters in, co in trouble, it's minor. And when it's eight notes for this, the, I mean, they have a detailed, the composer has, a, has handcuffs. And he said, yeah, you know, I, I scored like 14 thematic ideas and I mm -hmm. gave them to the director. He handed it to the uh, uh, three edit bays people that were editing. And every day they shot in London, they would do a layback of what they shot and put the music themes he wrote to it. So they were getting to know whether it worked. Now, these weren't written for the movie. These were just based on the script, on the discussions with the, produce, the director, who mm. he was a friend. They had done projects before, so they already knew each other. But Marvel comes in with 20 people, 25 people, just says, it's our way of the highway, dude. So do you want $10 million? and to do the big hit of the summer or, and do it our way, or do you want to go bye-bye? So what Tyler said is he said, okay, I take the 10 million, <clears throat> I do the job, but then I do five independent films where the, the director and the producers are down to earth and they're creative. So he gave up his creative license to do the job of that. <clears throat> like no two people, if you dip, paint paint a paintbrush into paint and you go to a canvas no two people can do the same stroke mm -hmm. so somebody locks you into a thing and if they hire you to do it or they hire me or they hire someone else each person has their own strokes so no matter how hard they constrict you you're still picking your color of gray your color of blue, you're, you're doing things so it ends up being you. It's still a Hallmark greeting card of creativity, but it's your, you're the one doing the art. <clears throat> mm. So you don't get to be wildly creative. So, but when you get to that point, you won't be asking these questions because you'll be so, so successful. You won't be, you won't have to 
to ask me that. But at this point, you're wondering, what do I do? But that's a good problem to have is to go, gee, you know, they want me to do this. They're paying me to do this. I better, you know, what are you going to do? You're a kid. So you're going to say, okay, I'll do what you want. You're not going to argue with, you're not going to say, I have this cool idea. We're going to use reverse accordions, you know, and we're going to record it in a fishbowl and then we're going to put saran wrap around it and, and then, you know, and we're going to jump on it. And, you know, like they're not going to buy that. <laughs> they're not going to buy that. You may think it's creative. You know, like they don't, <clears throat> creativity is different. There's productivity and creativity. Most of Hollywood is mostly productive with a small amount of, of creativity. Jerry Goldsmith was much more creative in his orchestrations, in his approach, than John Williams always picked the orchestra pretty much set all the time, same band. Jerry Goldsmith would say it's all violas and, and penny whistles and tam, uh, tambourines. You know, like he, he would make the whole orchestration different. So they both worked, did, you know, tons and tons of music and made lots of money, but one guy gets to do more creative stuff and one guy does more productivity. You know, and some composers can swing back and forth pretty good. Like, I, I can't name a lot of them that are successful at balancing that. But most of them are suck-ups. And what burns composers out is after a while you get tired of that. I got tired. I got tired, you know, of dealing with the system because the people that are producers were writers. They were in the writer's guild. The writer's guild has more power than the music guilds. So you don't see producers come up from the music side. You only see them come up from the writers. Writers think about words. They dream about words. They're not even filmmakers. If they could make a film that had just black and just people talking and words going like on a, on a crawl, they would get an arousal. You know, they go, oh, this is the coolest film ever. It doesn't have those actors and all those camera things. It's just my words, my, my precious words, you know. So that's, that's their fantasy. Our mm -hmm. fantasy is to do a film that has no people in it and just music. <laughs> so we're all dysfunctional, but somehow we cooperate to make a film. Because baby needs a new pair of, of shoes. You know, you have to, you have to, so at some point you're saying, I'm in the business or I'm not. Mm. And it's funny, this is a music business club and we haven't talked about the business yet, but we have talked about the internal business. And that, that's very valid too, because that doesn't get talked about. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah, that's that's good stuff. I was just as you were describing how the writer approaches it, you know, that's how directors and writers are talking about us in their zoom seminars, right? Oh, yeah. And so it's a nice bit of perspective. Don't be that, you know, and something that that Ron preaches every single time I've talked to him. It's a friendship 101. You it, the business is about people. Your your business is about people. Yeah. Right. So you take care of the music, but then the business is, is about being good people. So, okay. We do have more questions. Let's do it. Um, Allison's back. So uh, her question was next before uh, I get to that though, Mike's question is after that. And then I think um, Henry's is after that, but I want to make sure that we acknowledge Mike for putting this whole thing together. He's the one who coordinated everything. He's the one who got Ron together. He's the one who got me together. And he, he made this happen. Thank you, Mike. Great yeah. job. Really yeah. appreciate you facilitating this, this conversation. So thank you for doing that. So we'll go Allison, then Mike, and then Henry. Okay. Okay. Hi there. Um, thanks for talking today. Um, I have a few questions, so I'll just let you pick which one you want to answer, I guess. Okay. Um, my first one is what makes good business or bad business? Like, um, what, what do you define in that industry as becoming a bad businessman or a, a you know, a good professional mm -hmm. businessman? Um, mm -hmm. And then my other question is definitely more personal. I'm also at a crossroads, kind of like how Nathan was talking about. So maybe you kind of already answered this. Um, but I'm also thinking of like moving and 
I don't have a strong desire to stay within the country. But um, in terms of going to where like artistic work is prevalent, where would you recommend? Now, granted, that's coming from like a true like born and raised Pacific Northwestern. So um, LA does seem a little scary and all of those things seem scary to me. They're all scary. And, and we were there for 37 years. And I told my wife when we moved there, I said, we're only going to be here a year, honey. And we ended up 37 years and raised our kid there and bought five different houses. And, and I promised her we were going to come back to the trees. So it was a we wept when we came home. We really wept because we missed the tree. Every time we'd come up to visit families, we would miss it. So I think once you're a Northwesterner, it's in your blood. And really, during climate change and other alterations that are happening, we are going to have more water than California. We're going to have, you already see the fires and stuff. Uh, I think the best city for art probably in the world is London but it costs $5 million for a two bedroom apartment. Um, so it's a very difficult environment to live in. New York, same, uh, San Francisco, same. LA, yeah, a little bit more logical. So if you're a West Coast person, probably the best choice is, um, is, is LA. The thing is, see, like there's 300% more work there than anywhere else in what you want to do. So say you're trying to get a job in any field, you close your eyes and you throw a dart and it's going to hit something. Here, like Seattle, you throw a dart and you're, you're going to hit a dog. You know, it's not going to go, it's not going to hit, you know, there's post-production is not here. <laughs> the filmmakers are, work, are making films on a credit card. Alaska Airlines does commercials, but they do them with LA guys, you know, and bring them up here and film and they go as so the filmmakers are starving you know it's like a it's like a uh, uh you know they're stressed out so that's one part of the answer is you know and, and you might say look uh if i go to seoul korea that's not as much on the wall but their big thing there is is their their rock scene their pop scene k-pop k-pop is pretty good worldwide also, Mexico City, um, they're falling into, you know, the lake there. I mean, the, the city is falling apart, but, but they are very big in the Latin market. So, you know, the thing is, do you want to scale the castle? Which castle do you want to scale? Which one do you feel qualified to scale? I mean, these are, it's, it's like uh, when, you, when you become a Marine, they train the Marines. Everyone learns how to cock the gun, clean the gun, sleep with the gun, it's night. And then when they drop them in Afghanistan, everyone in the band knows how to shoot a gun. Everybody in the helicopter thing knows how to shoot a gun. That's a basic. So do you have the basic training to land in a different area? Say you go to Toronto or Vancouver. Vancouver has a bigger film industry than, than uh, LA because of incentives from the government, the province of British Columbia, the country of Canada, all that stuff. So they're supplementing everything. A lot of Americans up there, it's $75, 75 cents on the dollar. So you're making less money, but the cost of living's more than San Francisco. But that's just, you know, 90 miles from me. Uh, but you have to become a Canadian citizen or say you're going to pay your taxes there. If you pay your taxes there, you can go to Manpower Canada and get a job because you're paying your taxes in Canada. That's all Canada cares about. So there's many ways to skin a cat, but it depends on what you want to do. You know, if you're in publishing, if you're in uh, content creation, you're in all that. I mean, there's video games. Games are everywhere. They're huge in Japan, huge in China, huge in uh, Korea, huge. Some parts of Europe are cooking. Um, one young guy that graduated from um, uh, the big video game company over here, big game place in uh, Redmond, came and was an intern for us. Now he went to Scotland. He's in Edinburgh. 
or what's the other town? What's the other town there? Not Edinburgh. Um, I can't remember. But anyways, he's over there. There, yeah, the the more of a cow town. But he's got Glasgow. He's in Glasgow with his wife, and they love it. And that that's actually ha is a kind of an alternate for the BBC for post production. So he didn't have to move to London. He's in BB. He's working for BBC projects, but he's American in Glasgow. So, you know, but there is a lot of work. Like, I, I don't know if you saw the part I, I gave the bit about how big the pie is now in, in uh, for Netflix and all that stuff. It's a huge pie. And that means lighting people, filming people, editing people, cartage people, musicians, uh, location services, uh, transfer services, studio services, commissaries. You know, it's like a lot of people, you know, it's a lot of people. The Disney, until they just had their little fired a bunch of people, had the biggest, they're the biggest employer in California. Disney is. So, you know, that's pretty big to be bigger than Lockheed, Boeing, you know, all that stuff. And all you do is cartoons and, and uh, you know, uh, Frozen things like that, you know, in theme parks and they own ESPN and they own stuff, like, all these assets. But see, here's the thing is all these people are leaving LA and moving up to Seattle, buying houses. They're leaving job openings like crazy. If you're a young person like you are, that's who Disney hires because they don't want to pay for the guy that has all experience. So once you get to 40, they blow you off. If you go to Starbucks in Burbank and stand in line, I guarantee you there'll be a discussion. Somebody's pissed off at Disney. They just got, you know, they've been there for 20 years and now they're now, they got kicked out and they used to be a script supervisor. And then somebody next door would say, oh, that's funny. I used to work in the thing. You know, everyone has the same story and all the young people are being paid. Okay. You know, because their bottom line is they could have twice as many workers being paid half as much. What would you do? That's what Disney does. No, They're creepy. They're a creepy company. Don't trust Mickey. You don't know where he's been. You know, he's don't trust Mickey. Um, as someone that's worked for him. So the, 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 like I was saying to the early guy, when I was talking to Nathan or somebody, you're going to have to build your map. Like for for instance, now you have you have two interests. I don't like it here, and I want to go somewhere else, somewhere X. Well, if you embark on that trip, you're going to get lost. You'll be in Pocatello. At the bus station, you're not gonna you're gonna not like it. You need to figure out exactly your trip and your your motivation and what your integers are, so that you can figure out your plan. Because if you have your plan, you're going to succeed. But if you don't have a plan, the, the, the adventure will kill you. I mean, it literally will just knock the living daylights out of you. I, I, what I hope is that, the, that you can use the teachers, tap into them like you've never clawed into their brains. brains. Do not let them rest on their time out. Like you see them walking with a cup of coffee and a donut. Interrupt and say, hey, you know, I was just wondering, what do you think of Paris this time of year? Well, you know, it's kind of nice, but uh, they're kind of rude there, you know. Okay, rude. That's it. I can put that on my map. Paris, rude. <laughs> L.A., not rude, but arrogant. Yes, okay, I like that one, you know. Like, you know, you don't want to be an Uber driver in these places. You don't want to be get there and then be cleaning toilets. You want to get there to where you can bridge into it. So you have to do the research now and build your map so that you go, okay, when I get there, this is what's going to happen, you know? So, and there's people that are graduating out of USC that don't know what they're going to do. And they're right there. They're right there. They're flaming in it and they don't know it. I, it's, like the, it's like a selective, it's like a hysterical blindness. Maybe it's hormonal. I don't know. It's hormonal. If they if they figure out the result, they won't have zits. You know, like if they can figure out how to solve the music business riddle, 
they won't have zits. You know, it'll solve their their hormones. So I don't, I don't, I don't know what's going on with them because I never waited for that. I saw Hollywood as a big giant piece of cake, and I dove in, and slammed myself into it. And my wife and I, you know, we there were times when. We went to Gelson's in North Hollywood. We'd walk to the store, the Gelson store, and we had like two dollars. So we bought a loaf of bread and Betty Crocker's vanilla frosting. And we'd walk out to the curb on Riverside Drive and take a spoon. We'd bring a spoon and we'd share the Betty Crocker frosting. <laughs> Cause we said, if we're gonna die, let's die with Betty Crocker. You know, like we we went through that. We went through that suffering. It took us 12 years to buy put a down payment on a house. And all my friends that stayed up in the Northwest, they're going, oh yeah, we got our rancher. We got a ranch house. And, you know, we're, we're going camping in Paris this year. And, and, they were going, and they go, how are you, Ron? I go, well, <laughs> we're eating frosting. And, uh, you know, I'm writing, I'm copying music for Sinatra or whatever. You know, like... I, I wouldn't have anything to offer. You know, it took a while. Uh, it's a brutal, all these towns are brutal. If you don't know what you're doing, it's brutal. It's brutal in Ellensburg if you don't know what you're doing. You know, use Ellensburg as your, as your experiment, as your Petri dish, where you're going to grow your ideas. You know, like, I think, I think you need another, you need to stay with the program until you can build your map. Because then when you have your map, then you can choose what you're going to do and be informed about it and be smart about it. Because you need to be like a, a guided missile, not a shotgun. Shotgun ain't going to get it. Shotgun will get you something, but it going, it's going to hit grandma too. You know, it's, it's not going to... Want, you want to be a sniper and go right exactly at your target. And I... I when I lived in LA, I'd go to parties in Beverly Hills. I would meet people, you know, we'd meet guys, girls, whatever, all kinds of people. And there'd be young people. And I'd say, what do you do? And the lady, the girl would say, she's like 23. She says, I have four beauty salons on the West side. I go, how old are you? And she goes, well, you know, I started this when I was 17 and I came from Armenia and they, and they taken over like, Wow. I go, man, you're like, you're like tiger. I need to check you for rabies lady. I mean, they, they're, they're like, they're on fire and they have the, and that's where, that's where I brought this book. Exceptional. It's like, you need to go from where you are to exceptional because that's when people look at the resumes, they're going to choose exceptional. So that should be on your map. Say, oh, I need it exceptional. And they need to go where they recognize what exceptional is. And if you've already got exceptional, great, cross it off. Now you're working on survival skills. Now you're working on these other things. Use your summer break to go intern, go be part of this. Work for Warner Brothers. Work for NBC. See what it's like, you know? Do it. I mean, apply right now, like tonight. Apply for an internship at NBC. Now they'll say, well, COVID, we're not doing much. Be the first in line when it all wake. It's going to go over. It's going to change. We're not going to stay in this mode. Otherwise, we'll become cannibals. I mean, we can't live like this. This is stupid. They're going to solve this. We're going to get over this pandemic. And life will go on. And you want to be ready. You don't want to be ready as it breaks, you want to be ready before it breaks. Line up your chickens. Know your people. And it's and when Mark was talking and I talked, it's a people business. Do you know 30 people in the business? If you know 30 people in the business, chances are you're in the business. And, and even if you had no qualifications, I know people that don't know a cello from a screwdriver that are working in the music business. I know people in the motion picture, picture industry that are working, doing cinematography and stuff, don't know anything, didn't go study that in college. And dubbers and people like that. They just said, I want to do this. How am I going to do this? And they did it. And they didn't care what the price was. You know, do, I mean, 
if you go to Las Vegas and you say, I need to win, don't go to Las Vegas because the house always wins. It's stacked against you. Like, they're going to win. doesn't matter how many coins you put in unless you make a, a killing and walk away, and nobody will do that. They'll go, you know, I could gamble 10 of these back. I'll keep 90, 90 in my pocket, and I'll gamble this, see what happens. Pretty soon... You've lost that, and now you go back to the other one. Now you're in the hole. You're calling grandma to get a loan. <laughs> hey, I'm going to hit the big one, grandma. Come on. It's 3 in the morning. I'm at, I'm at uh, the Riv Riviera Hotel, and, and this guy here with the gun wants to pay, wants paid. You know, like, or I'm over. <laughs> you know, does that answer? That doesn't answer your question at all. That, no. But it was fun. It was a fun question. But it didn't and answer your question. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I just want to note out of, out of everything you just said, there's a reason why you're talking with us today. And that's because Peregrine Spaney reached out to you, went to one of your seminars and said, Hey, I'd like to talk. And, um, to go back to something a while ago, when you said you give advice to, to young people, meet five people a day, that doesn't have to stop in a pandemic, email five people a day, email five people, you know, 15 people a week. If one gets back to you, that's one more than, you know, in the music industry, Ron, you're someone who gets back to people if they have, I assume, fair questions and, you know, because you're open to that. You're open to networking. Not everyone will, but you'll never know until you actually reach out. So, I mean, if there's one like action step for you guys to do, start reaching out, just cold emailing people if you have to. I know Mike has emailed people and they get back. I mean, Mike talked to Nico Muley, uh, you know, just because he emailed him. Um, okay, so, okay. That's, you know, write that down and do people... that. There's people doing master classes every day like this. They're doing master classes and you can tap into them. You can, they, usually if they're doing a master class, you can contact like the greatest engineer in pop music. He just did a, a series of, of things. Well, he's available. You can, you can email him and he's open. And, and uh, you know, it used to be we would go to seminars, like you go to the NAMM show or you go to different things and hang out. Those are still good, you know, but right now we can't do that and it's all been canceled. But you can, like, I would, like, if you're a singer, I would get to know a session singer and ask them questions. Say, hey, I'm a student. They, they relate to that. They go, oh, you're a student. I remember being a student. And you go, yeah, you know, I'm sort of confused here. I'm going, gee, how do I get to there? How do I even open, how do I even get my foot in the door? And they'll say, well, you know, I can't talk to you right now. I got a session, but guess what? I'll get back to you then you can add that integer to your map. You've now got the interstate. You've now got pieces of the, it starts to fill in like those like jigsaw puzzles where it starts to look like something. And, then, and, the, and what it looks like is you and your future. It begins to be a, a, a puzzle that shows you together. So the more you get that people information, the better. And I guarantee you, like uh, I was teaching at USC, the graduate uh, School of Music, and um, one of the guys wrote a letter to Roy Disney at Disney, you know, like the brother of, of, of uh, Walt, who, who inherited the company, said, I have a dream. I've always dreamed about working for you guys. I want to I, I be part of the magic. I want to be part of the dream. I love this stuff. I will give anything. Roy calls him up and says, come, you're going to be my personal assistant. Yeah, it happens. It happens. It happens. You can get to anybody. You can get to anybody. I mean, it's, it's sad in a way, but you can get to anybody. And I get emails from Finland in a week, and I get emails from people, and, and they're always saying, I went to such and such a school. Now what do I do? And I keep saying, well, didn't they cover these things? I'm always amazed that I said, were you not listening? Because I'm sure you're, these are credible teachers that at the conservatory level, they were teaching you at, at the high school and everybody was telling you stuff. Were you listening? Or were you not ready to listen? Or were you, or do you, did you just go to a school where they didn't really care? You know, whatever it was, but they, but they, they don't know where to go. 
I think all I wanted to do was hopefully give you a, a breadcrumb to, to start figuring that out. Because if you don't figure that out, what's the point? You know, why, why are you studying? What are you doing? What do you, you know, use the time, your investment that you and your parents and the school is making in you. Use central Washington, wring it dry of blood. Don't quit. Stay there. Drain them. Make them kick you out. Stay until the lights go out. Work your butts off on that stuff because this is your time. This is the time you get, guys. This is it. You don't get 10 years from now. You're going to be having a kid, changing your tire, you know, looking for another house, stuck in bullshit. You need to use this time now. You know, think of this as a, a Christmas carol and all the ghost of Christmas past comes to you. Said you didn't, you were never nice to Tiny Tim. You know, and it shows you out on a horrible thing. And then you, you didn't show up for class. Your teacher said, please practice for this concert. And you didn't. And then the ghost shows you. You know, and it says, here's your future. You think you're going to play in the Philadelphia Orchestra, but no. You get to deliver the bongos to the back door of the bongo room. You know, <laughs> and, and you go, no, I don't want that future. I don't, what do I have to do? And you run out into the streets and you and you say i will practice my i will practice i will do what the teacher says <laughs> you know <laughs> i don't know i'm having too much fun mark <laughs> well i i do want to check in with you if you need to split you just say the word um you're being very generous with your time i got i got at least another 20 okay I got at least so 20. So we have, maybe we can get to three questions then. Mike had a question, Henry has a question, and then Alberto, I know, had at least another question. So, um, so let's, let's see what we can do with that. And we'll close at, at four. Is that okay? That's fine. Sweet. Okay. So Mike, take it away. Cool. I'm wondering, um, you've just left Washington, right? Or the Vancouver area, right? Or, or Portland, right? Um, you land in Los Angeles right? You don't know a soul. You don't know anyone. You don't have any gigs lined up. Like, how do you, how do you make it through that first year, right? Not just professionally, but like, what do you, what kind of, how do you make it through that first year, like emotionally and financially and like, not just within music, but in everything else that it takes to like, move to a completely unfamiliar place? Well, when I went to a private school to graduate, because I went to different schools, I had to sign a paper that I owed a government loan. I owed, like, this is ridiculous. It was only like 11,000, but I paid that off. So I paid off my student loan, paid for rent. We paid for food. We had a car. And my wife had to work at Pizza Hut. And I worked as a copyist, copying music by hand with ink for Hanna-Barbera, for whatever came in the door, records, whatever. And then I went to Dick Grove School and I paid that too. I, I mean, my, my parents did not jump in. You know, uh, they, they, they were middle class, but they, didn't, they never saved college. They just kind of thought we were urchins or something. We just grow up and figured out. So I paid all that off. I didn't, I didn't know anybody. I paid, I paid, it took me a while. And then when I started making money, you have to live on that money. You're not, you're freelance. So you're making money. You're not putting it faithfully away. And then taxes would come and I would owe money. So I remember like at least 10 years, I had to file extensions and keep paying back. I'd owe money and I'd owe money. Like fine, it took a while. That's why I couldn't get a house and it took me 12 years to get a house. Um, it wasn't until I started making big schmeckles, you know, and then then I get a big royalty check and I, and I go to the realtor and they say, well, do you have a down payment? I go, saboom, you know, here's 40 grand. Will that do? And they go, okay, now we're talking, you know. So it took a while, but it wasn't, it wasn't pretty. And I wish I would have had more survival skills. I wish I would have actually understood that better. But I, I, I think we did okay. And we're honest people. We worked hard. We were tried to be nice people. We tried to be friends. We had friends in the Dick Grove School were the most of my friends. 
and we started making friends professionally. And one thing I did too is I didn't mind risking. So even though I could get more money sitting in the copy office copying because it's like 30 bucks a page, you know, to copy a trumpet part or whatever. So I said to the head copyist, I said, uh, Zan, what's that guy with the motorcycle doing? Oh, he's, I'm paying him to go this, to the sessions. I said, to the sessions? I want to go to the sessions. I don't want to sit here in this room copying music. This is like torture. He's, I said, pay me. So I would, he would pay me 40 bucks. I'd take it to, this, to the sessions, and I got to get in the door. I could buzz the buzzer, go in. When I was in there, it was for Hanna-Barbera and stuff, and I, and I, I would, I, because I was a copyist, they didn't mind me being there. So when I was in there, I watched how everything went, and I looked at the music, I listened to things, I said, I could do this. So the next time I brought it in, I, I grabbed Hoyt in the hallway, the music director, I said, Hoyt. He said, yeah, what do you want? I said, I write, and I can write better than the people you're hiring right now. He goes, yeah, all right, right, okay, I'll see ya. You know, and I kept that up, and then, like, he said, come back two weeks, and uh, I'll talk to you then. Meet me in my office, and it was his, you know, car in the parking lot. And he handed me a show. I mean, that's how I got a show. I got Casper in the space you know, monkeys or whatever it was, some, some crazy show. And he hands it, just hands it to me. He says, here, go, do, see ya. You know, I mean, so it wasn't pretty, but it was, I risked. I could have stayed in the copy office, made more, made like $200 a day, but I risked and I just got 40 bucks, but I got an opportunity. You know what I mean? So do you have the instinct to say, I'm going to risk like you know when to hold them, when to fold them. I seem to know when to fold them, when to hold them pretty good to go, this is what I, this is where I'm aiming. And I got in doing Roger Corman films when he, James Horner was doing them and all these different people were doing them. Uh, Scorsese was directing, you know, uh, um, you know, they were coming up big filmmakers coming up and they couldn't work at the big studio. So they were working at the B films. So I got to work with great cats, you know, and, um, but I think you can't transpose that to many places because I keep pushing LA because I'm just saying it's a land of opportunity. You want to be where there's opportunity because you could be working really hard and being successful, but getting nowhere in certain places. If you go to Bozeman, Montana, forget it. If you go to, you know, Crystal Springs, Utah, forget it. I mean, you know, pick a place that's got a buzz and energy and go there because that's where you're going to, you know, like there's a zip code where that happens. And outside the zip, further you go out from the zip code, the less and less reality there. You know, Sacramento is not a place to launch your music publishing career, even though it's a big city. Seattle is not a place to, to launch your publishing career. New York is probably better. You know, uh, uh, Venice, Italy, you know, different places, Singapore. I mean, different places have stuff happening. Different people, places don't. So I would say I just subdivided the places to be. So it was not easy. We didn't know anybody. Nobody helped us carry our couch. We had all the, the, the student, you know, apartment stuff. And we got there and there were people sitting around the pool in the center of the apartment building. We parked the thing and I go out there and say, sir, sir, could, could you? And it just, he walks off. So my wife, you know, my little wife and me are carrying the couch. <laughs> carrying the couch that weighs like 900 pounds. <laughs> Because nobody cared. So, you know, welcome to LA. <laughs> you make it sound just so glamorous, Ron. It's, it's, it's glamorous. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's about as glamorous as it gets. Yeah, it's, you know, but that's how it is everywhere. I mean, if you go anywhere, Las Vegas, go anywhere, there is a weird underbelly. And like I said, at those three levels of the music business, if you boil it down, you're going to be spending the first chunk of time in that underbelly playing in the regional orchestra, not the big symphony. 
you're playing for 80 grand, not 800,000. I mean, you know, it's like you're getting, and you're not getting royalties. You're working for filmmakers that have a credit card and grandma's, you know, giving them a downment to make a film. It's crappy. And it plays online. It doesn't make any royalties. So, you know, there's a bridge that, but, you know, you go, okay, it's worth it because I'm learning. That's valuable. That's very important. Like, you know, like you're playing a video game. You go, if I, if I do this one move, I get weapons. I'm going to sacrifice to get the weapons. Now I can fight the big evil troll with the fireballs. That's what you have to do. You have to trade until you get enough of the defensive and offensive weapons that you can do that. And your brain is the biggest weapon you got. Your brain and your perseverance. So that's a big part of it. But anyways, next question. Yeah, so I think we have time for just two more questions. We'll do um, Henry's next and then we'll finish up with Alberto. All right, okay. Henry. Yeah, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you so much for talking to us. Like all of this is really helpful to me. Um, but yeah, so my question is, and I know, um, like you said, like figuring out, you know, future plans while you're a student, you know, is something I do think about a lot. But I wanted to know what you think about um, whether a person can like get their career started while they're a student, like, um, like if that has any like, um, you know, significance to like, whether they'll actually be able to be successful after school. Because yes. like, for me, like, um, I feel like all I'm doing is coursework. And by the time I'm done, all I'm going to have is a piece of paper. Yes, the answer is yes. I was doing record work in Seattle when I was still in college. I was doing, I started a music publishing company. Like uh, the bank across the street from Seattle Pacific, like, First of all, there were no classes and music business or nobody cared. My, my composition teacher didn't even come to my recital. Um, so the, at, at the bank across the street, they, they gave student loans to students because nurses and people like that. And usually people would use it for uh, incidental things, you know, like uh, uh, tuition or books. So I got $1,000 and I started a music publishing company. So I wrote these charts, wrote jazz charts, went, made onion masters, you know, onion, onion skin, which was before digital. And I went to the printer at the college. I said, can you print these? I want to make a hundred of each. And the guy goes, what do you want it? So they shot it with, you know, they used to have a photo thing above it, shot it, printed offset. I made covers. I had my, I had imaginary publishing. We went to the North, Northwest Music Educators Conference in Walla Walla or Yakima. I had all the, the charts in my trunk and I sold them out of my trunk. I was a freshman in college. I think it takes balls and I don't mean that in a, like only guys have it, but I mean, some girls have balls too. You have to be able to risk. Did, the first thing they teach you in business class is risk. If you ain't willing to risk, I mean, look at Elon Musk. He says, you know, wouldn't it be funny if I made a rocket ship? Now, how wacky is that? He would be drummed out of central Washington and say, you know what, dude, give up. You're a goofball. What's this rocket stuff you're doing? <laughs> Meanwhile, he's supplying this, the space station, making solar uh, industries that are incredible for saving the planet makes the Tesla the most powerful electric car ever made, you know, house charging things because he didn't follow the thing that he took a risk. Um, all of the, you know, all of the, you know, uh, Thomas Edison, everybody, they didn't just invent a light bulb. Look at the guy that invented the, the Dyson vacuum cleaner. He didn't he do like a hundred thousand versions to get that sucking power? He goes, well, I'd like to see version 99 and see how pissed off he was at that point. Oh God, we just made that one. Now oh, it's not working. You know, they, how many more do we have? 10,000 ah, more. Let's get drunk. You know, like they, they give up. They want to, I don't know how they do it. So you come from strong DNA. You go back to the beginning of mankind or you wouldn't be alive, right? Because each, ep each 
generation had to make a kid to go forward, right? So you're here in 2020. So you came from all that DNA. Use that DNA. Some of them are farmers. Some of them are business people. Some of them are partiers. Some of them are musicians. Some of them were, were preachers. Some of them were, uh, came across the, the prairies. Some of them went out of, uh, learned how to fly a plane. Some of them died in war. They did it. Now it's your turn, Skippy. You, you've got to step into that and go. Like, what? it shouldn't be fear. It should be joy. I can't wait to take it on. Take it on now in school. How you you can you can start a corporation for ten bucks. Start a corporation now. <laughs> Don't wait. <laughs> then you're going to be two years if you started as a junior. You got two years of corporation time, and you go down to get a bank loan. You move to San Francisco. The bank says, "Well, why should I give you a loan?" You say, "Well, I've had a corporation for two years." You're not saying it was successful, but you're saying you had a corporation. They go, okay, I'll give you a loan. You can start your record label. You can buy your gear because you've had two years of experience. You have a track record, but you don't have a track record if you're just dreaming. They give no track record for dreaming. So anyways, next, next question. Yes, okay. So Alberto, <laughs> thank you for your patience. Uh, go ahead and ask your question and then we'll, we'll wrap it up after that. Okay, yeah. Well, good thing it's the last question because it's kind of more of a personal question about uh, something you worked on. Um, so you, I know you did the theme song uh, for the Fairly Odd Parents, and um, I've heard stories from Butch of how that was the process of how that came to be. But I've never, because it's, you know, him, it's apparently you two did that. But I was wondering, what was that like for you personally trying to, you know, do that? Well, he, he, he handed me, um, well, Seth MacFarlane, who was young at the same time, and Butch both sort of like were merged together at Hanna-Barbera doing What a Cartoon, where they brought these young savant. Uh, Butch came from, I think, Southern California or Nevada or somewhere, and Seth was at uh, Art School of Design in Providence, and they found them and they brought him in. So they were friends. And so Seth was really the music guy. He was really known as understanding music. So he hired me and I was doing his shows. So when Butch got his show, Butch said, who should I get? Seth, Seth said, Ron, he did all these main titles. He did all these things. He knows how to do this stuff. So Butch hand, uh, gives me the uh, a fax of the lyrics. And it says, fairly odd parents, fairly odd parents. I said, I read that and I said, it needs to be odd parents, fairly odd parents. So I turned it around and, and I kept the, you know, Tammy is at that. And I kept the verse, but I turned the first, the chorus around. And I did two versions of fairly odd parents in one night, did a rough version with my MIDI setup. And he played it for his two daughters. One was two and one was four. And they liked the second one. That's how we got it. So I did that, that, I wrote that song in a half hour. And I had to write all those lines and everything. Like it had to make sense. I mean, it was the finished product. It wasn't just a demo. And then we re-recorded it in Salt Lake with the band and we put vocals on in Hollywood. Done. So he didn't really do much, you know. And I, I actually even couldn't go to the scoring session because I was sick. I was having like some sort of cramps. I couldn't get on the plane. So I sent my assistant. I sent my wife. I sent Butch. They got on the plane. They went to Salt Lake. You know, I mean, the music's on the paper. I didn't have to do a lot. But, um, you know, so that, and that's been a big hit. That's, that's, it was number one in the world. Most played song for broadcast three years in a row. And I know it's more than that, but they, BMI stopped giving me an award because I already had three of their crystal awards you know big awards they go you've had enough ron so three is enough so that's how that came about okay but i had to have the chops i had to know how to write i analyzed those flintstones jetsons all the ones that i grew up with i analyzed those to where i understood here's the melody 
here's the co and you got so much time. You got a half hour. I mean, you got uh, 30 seconds, 20 seconds to nail this thing. So you learn, I, I didn't, you copy songs because everyone listened to the radio or listened to the internet. Songs are not a main title. A main title is like, you know, 20 seconds or 30 seconds. And you got to hit a million people and go, bam. It's like selling cars. You know, it's like, a, it's like close to commercial music. You know, when you, when you do that and you put a vocal on, you say, it's this kind of vocal, it's this guy. So we'd, we would find the singers that sang like that. So on Fairly Odd Parents, it was actually the cast. The, you know, the ones that played the, the, the parents, the Fairly Odd Parents were, and they go, bells and they, they, they had this funny voices and, you know, and Timmy, stop it. And all these little voices, they did that like in real time. It was like two takes and they were done. It was so quick. It was like a half hour session. So um, that's your twin. <laughs> so does that yeah, answer it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it does. Sorry about that. It does. No Thank problem. you. That's good. Well, Ron, I wish we could just sit around and hear more stories, um, but you've already given us two full hours of your time uh, and some beside. well, quite a bit besides just getting this all set up. So, I just want to say a huge thank you on behalf of all of those who are here and those who will watch the video. Thanks so much for sharing your experience, your wisdom, and your challenges with us. Uh, it's, a, it's a real big deal, and um, I really, really appreciate it. I would, I would just say I would encourage them to look at the book list. I picked those because they are really amazing, and every intern or person that I've had go through and people I've professionals I've worked with in LA, I've given those things and they just go, Ron, that's, that nailed it for me. So I'm not pushing, I don't have an agenda and I don't get anything out of this. But what I want to do is I want to see kids succeed. I don't want you to Luke, get lost on that crazy map. Because if you don't know, if you don't have that map, you're going to get lost and it's going to be painful and it's going to be a waste of your, of your life and your energy. You know, we're creating, you, you're you teaching, I'm teaching with the all idea of making be people that are going to make a cool world, make a cool music industry. That's what I want. I want cooler people. You know, we got enough of the dummies. Let's get rid of, let's get some cool kids in. Let's get a whole new batch that does, does care. And these kids that have gone through what they've gone through are going to have a depth. You know, I had grandparents that went through the, Great Depression. They were cool. They always wondered if there was food in the refrigerator. They'd always fill it. They'd buy too much toilet paper, too much ham. But they they made great lives and they 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 did successful things. So you're going to be successful. Let me leave you with that. If you're going to be successful, and you don't have to follow my methodology, but you should pay attention to it and pull out what you think might work for you because I've done it. I don't have to prove anything. I've been making millions. I, I don't, I already did it, but you have it. So you're, you're embarking on this journey. Love the battle, love the skirmish, love the whole thing. Go out and, and do your quest and become better and greater and fantastic and or burn the world down in the process either make it or burn it you know but go for it don't play middle no more middle no working at arco you know no working at 7-eleven you are going to kill it okay that's what i want so take that information i hope you read it and and if you don't you don't know what you know you, what you're missing but Mark, thank you so much. It was a joy and we can do it anytime. It was a joy to talk to the students and uh, I hope I didn't freak them out. <laughs> hey, a little freaking out's not such a bad thing. Um, and so look, as far as the books go, we, we've shared the, the PDF with everyone. Um, we can get, if you have any questions about that, just let me know. We can get that information to you. And um, so I think that's a great way to end it. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Ron. And um, to all of you in the Music Industry Club and here, let's meet again. And, you know, if you guys want to talk about this more, 
you know, looking around this virtual room, if you want to know who are your people as you go through this crazy path, I mean, you've self-selected. You've sat here for two hours thinking about the music industry. You need to be connecting with the people who are next to you in these little boxes. Um, and if you want to find someone to reach out to, start right next to you, all right? So, hey, thank you, Mike, for setting this up. Thanks to everybody. Thank you, Ron. And uh, we'll see you next time. And I'll give you a list of some LA guys that are session more session guys. Yeah, so, actually, before I let you go, who is the who's the pop engineer who you were talking about who's doing master classes? Well, there's a ton of them. There's a ton. I mean, the Hall of Fame. I mean, there there there's guys from every walk of life. I mean, you can go on YouTube and type yeah. in if you've got like, say you got a book of the top engineers. Type in their name. They're all doing if they're alive. They're doing their master classes. So they're all up there. They're all, every single one is up there. And so I can't think of one that's not. And I mean daily. They are yeah. daily up there. So you can get Sweet Ann. You can get any of the cats that are up there. And even a, a bunch of people you don't know are up there. Yeah. You know, like, uh, um, I'm trying to think, Sylvia Massey. It's got a lot of stuff. Mm. There's a whole bunch of people. So like girls that wonder if there's producers that are the females. There's a whole bunch of women in music industry that are doing things so they're all during this COVID time creating content because they're freaking out they want to make uh content and they're reaching out so boy we're in fat city for information yeah I mean, just, no kidding. it is well anyways you guys take care and uh you know if you need anything else let me know thanks ron all right take care bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.